Today we have Preet Banerjee joining us for the Pan80 exclusive interview. Welcome, Preet. Welcome. Good morning. Very good morning. Preet Banerjee is the CTO at ANSYS, a leader in engineering simulation. Previously, he was senior client partner at Corn Ferry. Prior to that, he was executive vice president and CTO at Schneider Electric. Formerly, he was managing director of global technology R&D at Accenture. Before that, he was CTO and executive vice president at ABB. And prior to that, he was senior vice president of research at HP and director of HP Labs. Before that, he had a long experience in academia for 22 years where he played a lot of roles there. In 2000, he founded Axel Chip, which was sold to Xilinx Inc. in 2006. His research interests are in the electronic design automation and parallel computing, and he is the author of 350 research papers. He also supervised 37 PhD students. He received a BTEC in electronics engineering from IIT Kharagpur. He was also a president's gold medalist. He has done his MS and PhD in electrical engineering from University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Pete, welcome to Panity US interview. Thank you very much, Kiran. Share with us your journey from IIT Kharagpur to today. In what ways did your time at IIT Kharagpur prepare you for your leadership roles and how has the broader IIT network helped you in your career? So thank you. So IIT Kharagpur prepared me to learn new things. And that was literally the base, the most important thing that I want, I think the IIT people to understand. It is not the specific technologies that we learn at IIT, but the ability to learn to learn. That was the most important thing that I learned at, in, in IIT Kharagpur. And that has actually helped me throughout my career. Uh, so obviously Kharagpur prepared me for a fantastic education. I was fortunate to come to the US, uh, do my master's PhD, as you know, from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. But uh, through those very basic fundamental things that I learned in Kharagpur, I was actually able to learn from those to be a good professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign at Northwestern as, and be a dean myself. But so my first phase in my career, which you mentioned, was the 20 years that I spent in, uh, in academia doing fundamental research, working with fantastic PhD students, and sort of doing publications and so on. But then in the last sort of a dozen years, I've been in, in different roles in, in the corporate world, as you mentioned, roles at HP Labs, roles at ABB, at Schneider Electric, and now at ANSYS. And so my early years at IIT Kharagpur have actually taught me how to think. All my roles have been in, around innovation and how in, in an academic setting, you can think as an innovator doing long-term R&D in academia. I was also fortunate to do a couple of startups, as you mentioned in my bio, how to do sort of very focused innovation in a startup world and also in the larger companies like ABB, Schneider and Rancis, right? How you can lead long-term technology directions in these larger companies. Thank you. As an academic, you have guided PhD students. As an entrepreneur, you have built new products. And now as a technology leader, you're leading large organizations and perhaps transforming the next generation. As you reflect, what do you think is the most important skill required to be successful in each of these roles? What or who was your inspiration, if I may ask? Sure. So again, the three areas that we have been, I've been working on so innovation, as I said, in all three kind of uh, categories. So when you are innovating in an academic setting, you are thinking really, really long-term, right? Like five, 10, 15 years out in the train, right? So I was, uh, so to give you an example, right? When I was at Illinois, I was working on parallel algorithms for electronic design automation, right? This was, the year was 1990s, 1992, et cetera. And parallel computing was just coming around, right? People were 
coming up with parallel architectures like the Intel Hypercube or Intel Paragon and so on, right? Distributed memory using message passing and so on. And I was trying to do work on, on taking complex electronic design automation algorithms like placement and routing and simulation and putting them on these Hypercube machines. And industry said, hey, why are you working on those kind of things, right? The year was 1990, right? Fast forward to 2020, right? Today, you have many of these electronic design automation companies, EDA companies, Synopsys, Cadence, and ANSYS, the company I work for, we have our latest simulation software running on the high performance computing, right? Fluent, our fluid solver today runs on 200,000 cores, right? Now, this is the year is 2020, and I was working on parallel algorithms in 1990, right? All my PhD students are working on this. And when they were interviewing, they said, hey, why are you working on those things? So academia, you're always 20 years ahead, right? I used to, I wrote my first book on parallel algorithms for VLSI computer design, right? Prentice Hall, right? In 1994, and people said, why are you doing this? Well, why? Because 20 years from now, right? In 1920, 20, 2020, right? People are actually using it. I mean, I mean, there's Cadence, Synopsys, right? They all have their software running on parallel machines uh, on the cloud, right? So that's kind of what academia, academic research is, right? It's about the future, 10, 15, 20 years in the future, right? When I did my startup, um, let me talk about the first startup, Accelture, right? It was about a electronic design automation software to take MATLAB algorithms and put a push of a button, generate register transfer level VHDL to transfer to to compile into Xilinx FPGAs, right, or Alter FPGAs. Really focused project, right? It was a result of a of an uh, of an academic uh, project that I had from DARPA at, at Northwestern, right? But that the effort was to take that and come up with a product, right? Well, it was Excel FPGA. But now that I'm in larger companies. It is about how do you take a very large company's products, whether it's ABB or Schneider Electric or, or ANSYS, right? And how do you get, guide the innovation system of this larger company to make much more focused products, right? For much bigger customers. So the, the pace of innovation and the range of innovation is different. Academia is really, really long-term. With a startup, it is very focused on one particular problem that you're trying to solve. In a larger company, you're solving a bunch of sort of long-term innovative things, a whole suite of innovative products for a lot of customers. How do you think engineering simulation will evolve in the future? And what new technology trends do you think will power that evolution? So engineering simulation, uh, we what I mean, ANSYS is trying to do and, and this whole industry is trying to do is to help our customers in truly innovating new products. Let's say you are a aerospace or defense company, right? You are trying to build the next sort of aircraft, right? In the past, people designed new aircraft wings or engines and so on, and they built a little hardware prototype of that wing and they tested that wing inside a wind tunnel, right? Though that was called hardware-based prototyping. And you put a high-speed wind through it in the wind tunnel and you saw whether the wing actually lifted or not and whether there was a drag and at what point will it stall, right? Those were hardware-based prototyping. These days, the, but the world around us is physics, right? I mean, there's Navier-Stokes equations which actually defines how fluid flow happens over a wing. Now, with detailed simulation enabled by finite volume methods, finite difference method, finite element methods that are powered by ANSYS, you can model the physics in the most accurate manner, right? That you actually don't need a wind tunnel these days, right? So we are enabling what is called virtual prototyping where a designer, you Kiran can sit in your room, right? In your office, run these simulations in the most accurate manner using Fluent from ANSYS or whatever, similar tools from other, other companies, right? But when they run it in the most high performance computer, right? On say powered by, by Amazon, right? Essentially the, the beauty is that analysis is so accurate, you don't need to do this simulation, right? Do a hardware prototyping. 
So what this is enabling innovative companies, right? Engineers at in aerospace defense companies or automotive companies or high tech companies, all oil and gas, right? And ANSYS actually supports all these verticals, right? Mm -hmm. Is to design innovative products much faster. So it allows our customers to grow top line revenue and do bottom line savings because the R&D cost is reduced. You don't have to build a hardware prototype. You can do it through simulation and you can do much, much faster sort of product variations, right? What it, what cost you nine years to do for a product in an automotive industry, you can accelerate the time to three years, to 18 months, to a year, right? You can do much faster product innovation, lower the cost of R&D and drive much sort of lot more innovative product. That is the power of innovation. Now what is happening is we are now embracing newer technologies like AI machine learning to accelerate simulation, like high performance computing to accelerate simulation, like the cloud to accelerate simulation, using augmented reality, virtual reality, AR, VR, right? So there's a whole bunch of technologies we are bringing to our customers, but the end game is how do you build much more innovative products safely, reliably, and faster? You have served on the board of directors of numerous companies. What are some of the most insightful behaviors that you observe from other board members? And what do you think is the best way to help founders as a board member? So Kiran, I have had the pleasure of working on two public boards, Cray, the supercomputer company, and Cubic, which is a transportation and, and, and government uh, mission systems company. And, and so in those public boards, I have had the pleasure of working with I was nine, eight to nine other board members. And they, these board members have incredible experience in their area. But in both these companies, public companies, I was able to serve on their technology and strategy advisory committee, for example, to help Cray move, they're a supercomputing company, high performance computing, but to allow them to move into the new area of big data and machine learning and analytics, right? So help Cray move from being a pure hardware company into a software company, AI, ML, and so on. Similar conversations are going on in, sorry, Cubic, right? How do you take a, a company which is doing sort of transportation and so on and to move into the new area of digital and so on? So just the process of taking a large public company and to sort of advise them in the new areas of technology and so on is, is absolutely fascinating. And the other board members are, are really deep and knowledgeable and they bring all kinds of skills to the table, right? So that's one set of interactions in the public boards. I also serve on some private company boards, right? So like a uh, software motor company, right? This is a, it's a startup company trying to change the world in terms of a sort of a, a switched reluctance motor to do much lower energy consumption for motor designs and so on in the new world of EV that you kind of uh, talk about, right? Now in the private boards, it is obviously, it's a whole new thing, right? It's a, they're raising sort of series A, series B, series C financing, right? And how do you work with those entrepreneurs and help them guide their direction as to how they can work with, with newer customers and, and, and how they can pivot from one area to the other and so on. In addition, I have had the pleasure of working with several sort of on the technical advisory board of various startups, uh, sort of in the AD industry, companies like Ambit Design Systems, Calypto, and a whole bunch of others. So the roles are quite different, uh, but the stage of the company is also different. Yes. What would be your advice to current students and alumni to be successful in their professional life? Well, this is, who am I to give advice? I mean, this is, this, these uh, students from IITs are absolute gems, every one of them, and you are a gem and, and, and everybody else is so. But I can, all I can say is that our IIT education has prepared us, as I said, to learn how to learn new things. It's not the specific things about the strength of materials or the boundary value problems or, or the programming that we learn. What we have learned in IIT is how to learn the ability to learn new things throughout our career, right? I mean, there is a bunch of stuff I learned in IIT Kharagpur, which was fantastic, but I learned programming in Fortran. But now 
I program in other languages, the more modern languages. But it's not like, oh, IIT Kharagpur taught me to learn pro Fortran programming. It taught me to learn programming, that skill set, right? So that's the advice I would uh, share with my other IIT alumni uh, people that it's that ability to learn, which is continuous learning throughout my throughout the career. The advice I would give is to uh, help other IIT uh, alumni, right? In the networking, right? Help your colleagues, help your other alums in their in their businesses and their journeys and so on. When you are a Harvard alum, right? I mean, if you are a Harvard alum, those Harvard alums help other Harvard alums in their businesses and so on. I mean, I've heard like when McKinsey recruits the first bright young people, right, from the Harvard Business School. The reason they do that is they are take playing the long game. In 20 years, those Harvard alums in the batch of 2020, in 20 years will be the CEOs of the different companies. And now those people working for McKinsey in 20 years will therefore use that network to get those fantastic strategy consulting agreements, engagements from those companies. Right? We from the IITs don't play that long-term game. We need to. And that's something I've just joined the, the Pan IIT board to actually help position the Pan IIT board conversation, not to just do a bunch of Pan IIT meetings, but to see if we can actually set the stage to create that strong Harvard, Stanford types of alumni networks, which they use a lot in their business relationships, right? If you're a startup, founder, you're trying to raise money from a VC. Guess what? Many of the VC firms are actually led by IIT people, right? Do we, as a, as a standard method, right, connect our entrepreneurs with those VCs with the IIT connections, right? Once you are doing a startup, right, you want to do the first customer from a top company. If that, the VP of engineering, the VP of uh, operations, right, the CIO is from an IAT alum, right? How can I use the IAT network to get that first customer contract, right? So these things help in customer connections, in business connections. You do want to do a partnership with Amazon. Hey, you are from uh, at Amazon, right? If I am a startup, right? I want to do a deal with, with Amazon as a partner. I should be able to use that IAT network. This is how I think we can all help each other. Absolutely, that's great. Is there anything else that you wish I had asked you today? Well, uh, I would like to talk about some of the personal people uh, who have influenced my, my career. Uh, and I would like to actually talk about one such individual. Uh, I have been influenced in my entire career with my brother, uh, Sanjay Banerjee, who is a, a distinguished professor at uh, University of Texas at Austin. And he has been my blazing this thing throughout my career. He's, he's a couple of years my senior. He and I both went to IIT Kharagpur. We both went to uh, University of Illinois for my PhD. And to this day, every step of my career, whatever I take, I take advice from my brother. And, uh, and so I would like to recognize my brother for all the things I have done in my life. I'd like to also thank him. Sure. I would like to thank my brother. So, uh, and how would you actually advise some of the people who are crossing these boundaries between academia and startups today? I'm pretty sure 20 years back when you made the transition, it was probably a one-way street. But I have seen a lot of these people uh, going back and forth between academia and startups these days, especially uh, those in Bay Area, we have seen a lot of these things happening. How do you think they should strike a balance? And uh, what, is, what, is, what are the outcomes that they should aspire for? So I will tell you, one of the things that, I mean, I have a sort of a little uh, hypothesis that I've created that people often think that with large companies, right? Technology transfer happens. So if you're IBM or Intel and you fund some research at, at the University of Illinois, and all the technology transfer would happen from University of Illinois to Intel, right? Because they gave the grant. That is actually not what happens. 
when a large company does a partnership with a smaller company, with, with a university, the actual technology transfer happens through that student from the University of Illinois who leaves the University of Illinois and joins Intel, that knowledge transfer happens through that individual. However, if you want to have technology transfer happen from a university to a larger company, it happens through the startup, right? I mean, I will tell you, a, so I was a, a, at Northwestern, I was trying to create this technology on this Excel chip, right? I mean, and, and if I had just given that technology to a Cadence or a Synopsy or a Mentor or, or Xilinx, it would not have gone. The fact that I started the company Excel chip, took leave from the university, passionately created the technology of Excel chip and then ultimately made the product and then Xilinx acquired Excel chip. That is where the technology transfer, true tech transfer happened from Northwestern through Excel chip to Xilinx, right? The one way is through hiring those people. As I said, you, the PhD student goes from Illinois or Northwestern to Xilinx, that's one way. If you want true technology transfer, it actually happens through that startup. Because in a startup, what happens is, and you asked an important question, how should people in academia think about it, right? So if, if people in academia are these long-term thinkers, right, there's fantastic professors who are working at Berkeley and Stanford and Illinois and Georgia Tech and Carnegie Bell, right? And they should do their stuff. But if they really want to transfer the technology, they have to take that thing, right? take leave from the university, do your startup. And in during that time, you are super focused on doing the startup, right? That we are not then doing long-term R&D, forget those DARPA and NSF kind of product things. And so now you are building the product. So you have to literally change from doing long-term R&D to building a product, which is what I did during those years when I was doing Excel, right? But then they have to, they face a choice, right? And, and, and I'm, uh, I see this all the time investors want to see, hey, are you really committed to the startup or are you not, right? You cannot go both ways, right? So when I was doing Excel chip, the Series B investor said, Prith, at this point, do you want to make a switch? Are you 100% in or you want to go back, right? Now, at that point, I chickened out. I actually went back to Northwestern as a professor, right? But many people, the academia, academic people have to make that choice, right? They can do this for a year or so while having both sort of a, a leg in both, both parts, right? Some people I know in academia make that thing. They give up their tenure prof, uh, professorship and they join the startup and make the success, sort of start successful. And mm -hmm. I did that in my life, not for the startup, but when I joined HP Labs, right? I, mean, I gave up a tenured position, a deanship at the University of Illinois to come and run HP Labs. What if that had not worked out? I would have lost my tenure, right? That's, that's the fear that people have. And many people, including my brother, told me, hey, are you crazy or giving up tenure to do this? Um, I, I, I figured, hey, I'm going to give, to give it a chance. And if things don't work out, hopefully there will be a university that will want to take me back because the combination of University of Illinois, Northwestern and HP Labs would allow me to get a good academic position at a future point. But that was a risk I took, right? And I hope other academics take that risk. This sort of so-called, this thing, oh my God, I have tenure, I will not give it up, right? It is a kind of a crazy thing that oftentimes I think about. I would encourage them to take that risk. I took it and I became so much more, uh, I learned so much in my career journey, right? To HP Labs and ABB and Schneider. Had I been risk averse, I would still have been a dean at the University of Illinois. And I think I would have been worse off. So that's my advice to my academic colleagues at, at uh, former, I mean, sorry, IIT alums in academia. I would like them to think about this. On the other hand, they can absolutely stay in academia and do the cool long-term R&D, working with NSA, working with DARPA and so on. And there's nothing wrong in that. And my brother, Sanjay Banerjee is doing that very, very successfully at the University of Texas at Austin. But that's sort of the two things. If you really want to do this, take the thing, jump, it's okay. If it doesn't work out, you all can always go back and work in academia. Well, those are terrific uh, insights. Thank you so much for sharing all those uh, details from your uh, journey and transformation here. So there's one other thing that I wanted to ask you. 
now that you have been uh, seen what happened in the last couple of months with COVID-19, things are changed a lot. Uh, it's a very, uh, all ec education and also uh, corporate has all gone work from home, literally, like, you know, remote uh, working capabilities. So when, when we actually resume after this normalcy is restored, do you think this will have a lasting impression? How is the workplace or teaching going to be transformed in the longer term? I absolutely think this is going to have a long-term impact. So let me tell you two things, right? Within ANSYS, right, we have like 1,500 R&D engineers, and that's sort of what I'm, I'm, I'm responsible for, the R&D part and so on, right? And we thought, oh my God, these people cannot work together and their, their product releases will not happen. So let me tell you, today, May 15, is when we had our own internal release art to release milestone right across we have a lot of products and so on and we have lots of innovation that has happened in the last three four months right and that r d engine has not stopped at all right in fact our r d engineers were a lot more productive during this time through working with zoom and teams and so on right all of them worked from home and they were able to get all their r d productivity absolutely up right I have meanwhile in the last two months, right? I mean, as CTO, a lot of my role is external roles, right? And, and in the past, I used to fly out to different customers, right? I live in Palo Alto. I work for a company headquartered in Pittsburgh. Every week, I used to be in travel, right? Travel to Detroit, travel to, to Chicago, travel to Paris, travel to whatever, Tokyo and so on. I used to spend so much time in flying to visit customers in their location, right? It's just a three hour meeting in Tokyo. I would spend like four, three days, right? One day traveling, one day flying back, et cetera, for a three day meeting, right? These days, I have meetings with customers in Tokyo, in Paris, in Detroit, in Michigan, in whatever, right? All in the same week, I can, <laughs> I can pack it up, right? And people are completely okay. Just like I'm talking to you, I am having, I do demos of software. I do things, bring people together. I'm having innovation workshops with our customers, right? In a fantastic way. So I am now becoming a lot more productive. So when things come back out of the COVID virus, our R&D people will keep, keep collaborating. The meetings with customers will happen with sort of with this Zoom kind of things and set, right? And our customers, right? So when they're building innovative products, they were trying to do these hardware prototyping in a lab. Now they're saying, you know what? This whole journey towards software-based prototyping got accelerated because of this, right? So they are now saying, hey, you know what? I don't have to go to the lab. I can do this beautifully with the ANSYS tools and so on, right? So they are making more progress in software-based validation, right? For an autonomous driving, right? You have to drive this car for 8 billion miles. It'll take 400 years to do full autonomous driving, right? To do the testing, you can do the full autonomous testing on a computer. And that's what we are actually doing for BMW, right? So imagine all these major, major changes that are happening, right? And then, you, I mean, I know you work for Amazon on the cloud, right? So we are now seeing a lot more stuff running on the cloud because of COVID-19, because you cannot run these things on a, on a laptop. So there, our customers are being forced to run all these things on the cloud, be it Amazon or Google or, or Azure, or Microsoft and so on, right? So these things are going to have a significant impact in the way we do business in the future. It's not like you don't, I mean, I, I'm not saying that we'll stop meeting customers. We will meet customers the first time. The first thing that handshake is important, but future meetings, I'm convinced, will happen a lot more efficiently uh, through Zoom meetings and so on. On that note, thank you so much. Uh, there are a lot of great insights and uh, projections for the future. I hope everybody has enjoyed this interview. Thank you again, Pete. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.